Uh, welcome to the 31st Theoretical Physics Colloquium at ASU. Today's speaker is Professor Gerald Don, uh, professor at the University of Connecticut. He is a fellow of the Institute of Physics in UK and fellow of Connecticut uh, Academy of Sciences Engineering. He got his PhD degree in, 19, in 1988 from the Imperial College London. He had a postdoctoral position after that for two years at MIT. Later, between 1990 and 1992, he worked as an instructor in applied mathematics at MIT, and he got his faculty position at the University of Connecticut in 1992. And he remained there since then. Uh, he uh, did in the past some uh, valuable professional service. He served on the editorial board um, and section editor of classical and quantum field theory at Journal of Physics A. He is now serving as a, on the editorial board of Physical Review B. He also serves on the International uh, Scientific Advisory Board of Max Planck Institute for Nuclear Physics in Heidelberg. He is an expert in theoretical physics, quantum field theory, mathematical methods in physics, theoretical particle physics, and uh, I'm very glad that he agreed to give this talk today in theoretical physics book. And with that, I'll give the microphone to Gerald. Thanks, Igor. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks for organizing this series. It's been very interesting. I've enjoyed it a lot. So today I want to give an, a sort of overview of this uh, topic of resurgent asymptotics and some applications to um, quantum field theory. And this is a moderately new topic, so I want to give a fairly elementary introduction, <clears throat> just illustrating the main ideas with some simple examples. And I'm very happy to take questions both during and at the end. So just start with some general motivation of some very hard problems that we would love to make some progress on. And this audience doesn't really need this slide, but things like the QCD phase diagram made very difficult by the sign problem uh, finite density, things like non-equilibrium problems at strong coupling, which made difficult by the necessity of using complex contours like in the schwinger keldish formalism, things like quantum critical points in strong coupled systems, and things like quantum gravity or even just quantum field theory and curved space-time. These are interesting problems to this audience and they're problems with known difficulties. So this is some of the motivation and what I mean by extreme quantum field theory and extreme conditions, a list of some of the potential applications of these methods. And by extreme, I mean strongly coupled, very high density, a system that's driven very fast, a system that's ultra cold in the presence of strong fields, strong curvature, and for example, heavy ion collisions cover almost all of those uh, um, topics. Now, some of the standard tools for addressing problems like this in quantum field theory would be perturbation theory, semi-classical methods like instantons, numerical methods, which are very powerful, Monte Carlo, and things like asymptotics, large N, strong coupling, weak coupling expansions. But for these problems in extreme situations, these standard techniques have various limitations that we're all aware of. And one of the ideas underlying uh, resurgence is that it's a form of asymptotics that has the potential to unify these approaches. And why that's, that would be helpful is that each of these different approaches has its own advantages and disadvantages. And if we can understand how they're related to one another, we may learn something new and develop some new computational methods. So underneath all of this, there's a technical problem, which is what does the quantum path integral actually mean? And by mean, I really mean mean in terms of uh, a computationally useful understanding of the path integral. So just to start off gently, of course, we all know the Feynman picture of summing over trajectories between neighboring points, weighted by this phase involving the action of the um, um, path. And in quantum field theory, this is upgraded, of course, to 
summing over configurations also weighted by the appropriate action. So these formal expressions, we understand what they mean. Uh, the question I wanna talk about today is how we can actually use that to calculate something. So of course, the first thing we learn from this is the connection to classical physics that a stationary phase approximation singles out the critical points, which is how we formulate classical physics. So that's obvious. Perturbation theory is very efficiently encoded in terms of functional integrals, much more uh, easily than any other formulation of quantum field theory. And in that language, perturbation theory is, can be viewed as fluctuations around the trivial saddle point coming from the quadratic part of the action. And other saddle points, so other critical points of the action would be identified with what we would call non-perturbative physics. If the action is non-zero evaluated on one of these saddle points, then that would give a non-perturbative exponential type contribution. And the idea in resurgence is that if you had a satisfactory definition of this functional integral, and I'll, I'll say exactly what I mean by satisfactory in, in a little bit, the implication of that would be that the different saddle points would be related by some form of analytic continuation, which has the immediate consequence that perturbative methods and non-perturbative methods would be unified and connected. And everybody already knows that there's some connection between perturbative methods and non-perturbative physics, but it turns out it's actually much deeper than you might expect. So the simplest example, and I'll, I'll use this example several times during the talk because it captures a lot of the ideas and it's something that everybody understands well, goes back to the work of Stokes and optics and diffraction. So here's the integral representation of the airy function. And you'll notice, of course, that it looks a little bit like a zero dimensional path integral. And there's an external parameter here, X, which you might wanna think of as a chemical potential, but you might also wanna think about rescaling it and thinking of it in terms of some H bar type parameter. And what's interesting about the area function, of course, is that when X is positive, it has an exponential decay, but when X is negative, it has an oscillatory behavior. And Stokes was the first to understand that this change from an oscillatory to an exponentially decaying behavior was due to a change in the dominance of different saddle points in this integral. And of course, this integral being highly oscillatory cannot be evaluated in any efficient way by doing the integral along the t-axis. For example, Monte Carlo would fail dismally at trying to evaluate this integral. Actually, the problem is much more interesting than that because this Stokes phenomenon, this Stokes transition really occurs in the complex X plane, not just going from positive X to negative X. So here's a plot of the real part of this area function in the complex X plane. So this is the positive real axis along here. That's the negative real axis along here. Can you see my pointer, by the way, Igor? Yes. Yep. Okay, okay. So this is the positive real axis, the exponential decay. This is the negative real axis, the oscillatory behavior. But you see that something interesting is happening at plus or minus pi over three and at two pi over three and four pi over three. There's exponential growth along two pi over three and four pi over three. And there's oscillatory behavior along pi over three and minus pi over three. And these are called Stokes lines and anti-Stokes lines. And there are absolutely precise connection formulas relating this function here to other regions. And the only way to really get these things under control is to deform the contour of this T integral into the complex plane. And by rescaling the parameter X to have a real part R and a phase E to the I theta, you can see that these contours have to end up in the Z plane. So T has now become the complex Z has to be going in one of these three directions, zero, two pi over three, or four pi over three, in order for this dominant part to be uh, converging. But modulo that, you can break this integral into some linear combination of these basic well-defined contours. And depending on the phase of X, as you vary this theta, 
which saddle points contribute and which gammas you should choose to define this originally ill-defined integral depends on both the magnitude of x and more importantly on the phase of it. So this I think is not something I have to dwell on much more. This is well known because of the applications in optics and quantum mechanics. But this is a sort of level of detail we'd like to be able to understand in a um, path integral. Because for example, it would give us better understanding of what it meant to analytically continue in the chemical potential, for example. So one of the messages at the outset is that even in one dimensional integrals that are oscillatory and of this phase form, e to the i something, we can't make any real progress without using complex analysis and contour deformation. That at least suggests that it's worth thinking about similar methods in the infinite dimensional context of path integrals, which immediately raises the problem of what is the actual connection between a Minkowski space path integral and a Euclidean one beyond just the simple cases where, the, where a simple Wick rotation is sufficient to understand the connection. So what I mean by a satisfactory formulation of a functional integral is one that should be able to describe these types of Stokes transitions as various parameters appearing in the action, such as temperature or a background field or some curvature or some chemical potential are varied then the relevant saddle points for whatever you're trying to calculate may well change. And your definition of the functional integral should be smart enough to be able to handle that. And so the idea is to use some of these ideas from this uh, resurgence, which I'm about to talk about, to make some progress along this, these lines. So now a few words about the mathematics of resurgence. And I assume that most people aren't terribly familiar with it. It's a moderately new idea in mathematics on the time scale from the 1980s, but the original ideas can be traced way back to Stokes. One aspect of the problem is that if you have a perturbative series in some small coupling, that this should be generalized to something referred to as a trans series, which is essentially, roughly speaking, a triple sum over perturbative terms, exponentially small terms, which we would refer to amongst us as instant on terms and also powers of logarithms. Now, strictly speaking, but I don't wanna spend time going into this, but people are welcome to ask me afterwards. A full trans series should allow for iterations of exponentials of exponentials and logarithms of logarithms of logarithms, et cetera. But this is the type of structure for the problems I'll talk about today. And you see now there are coefficients that depend on these non-perturbative terms, the perturbative terms, and these logarithmic terms. And a consequence of requiring this trans series to be well-defined under analytic continuation is that it necessarily unifies the perturbative terms, the exponential terms, and the logarithmic terms in a way that they have to be connected in order to restore these non-perturbative connection formulas that are not seen in just formal perturbative expansions. So that was the goal in mathematics and it's very well explored in, in the world of differential equations and it's starting to be explored in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. Now, where does the name come from? So the name was coined by jean Carl, the pure mathematician behind this formalism. And the idea is here, look at the, this raindrop picture Imagine these droplets correspond to different saddle points or different critical points, or even just different points that you want to expand about for something. And these circles, these ripples are supposed to represent the fluctuations around that particular saddle point. And the idea of a car that is very generic, and I'll discuss that in a second, that given these special singular points or critical points, the behavior near any given one of these critical points is actually related to the behavior, the fluctuations near, let's call it, say, the origin, one of these points. And of course, you can shift where you start. And so this means that there are an intricate set of relations between these different sets of fluctuations. And if you think of this in terms of physics and think of, say, this fluctuation as being perturbation theory and these other ones being different non-perturbative saddles, 
This means that there can potentially be useful connections between these different fluctuations. And there's a bold big conjecture, which in certain contexts actually has a proof that this structure should hold for all in quotes, natural problems. And I've spoken to many of the mathematicians in this world, this world of resurgence, and they give different definitions of natural problems. But roughly speaking, it's something that, uh, something that is generated from a closed set of equations like differential equations or integral equations. Okay, so these are big claims. Let me just show you an example. If we go back to this ordinary exponential integral, where this function f in the exponent, think of it like the action, has multiple critical points, let's say at least two. And let's talk about the expansion near one of the saddle points, let's call it number n. And let's suppose that Cn is the steepest descent contour that goes through that particular saddle point. Once you're going on a steepest descent contour, this is a completely well-defined integral. You can calculate it in any number of ways. The dominant contribution, of course, is this exponential factor. The Gaussian fluctuations give you something like this. And that's where we usually stop in most applications in physics. But of course, it's still multiplied by some formal expansion in powers of h bar. These are, encode everything beyond this Gaussian approximation of truncating in the Gaussian fluctuations near the cell point. So I can write this fluctuation factor as a series in h bar. Now, just be careful, there are several um, superscripts and subscripts here. The subscript r is referring to the order of the fluctuation and n is labeling which saddle point I'm expanding about. But if f has multiple saddle points, it turns out that those other saddle points influence these guys and they influence them in a very specific and completely generic way. And the large order growth of the fluctuations around this saddle point are actually directly related to the fluctuations around the neighboring saddle point in the following way. The generic growth is factorial in the order. And then you sum over the neighboring saddle points. And there's a power, which is the difference between the function evaluated at the two saddle points. So think of that as the action difference. And then there are subleading terms that go like r minus two factorial, r minus three factorial, et cetera, with, and you can pull out fat powers of the uh, action difference. But the interesting thing is that the coefficients in this expansion of subleading contributions are the low order contributions of the fluctuations here. So the high orders here are directly encoded in the low orders here and vice versa. And this is completely generic. And it's a quantitative relation between these. And this is a fact for these uh, finite dimensional integrals. And it has been seen in some examples in quantum mechanics and quantum field theory in the infinite dimensional context. So let me just translate that a little bit into a specific uh, example. Uh, uh, Gerald, I'm sorry, but uh, uh, looks, looks coefficient are singular, right? As uh, you know, if you are going uh -huh. along this integer R or uh, uh, you see, because you have this R minus one. Yeah, well. yeah, it's the, yeah, it's the expansion around R equals infinity. You mean that yeah. that, that, that coefficient is singular indeed uh, as function of R, or? Well, well, no, this, this is this is the large order behavior for large R. Uh, so so it's a for large R. I see. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. At large order, right? The universal large order behavior of these fluctuations. Okay, so so this minus one minus two, not that simple. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me show you an example just to uh -huh. clarify this. So let's go back to the area function again. The thing in the exponent was cubic, so there are two saddle points. Let's call them plus and minus. This is a very simple problem, so we know the exact expression for the fluctuation coefficients. It's, there are two factorials on top and one on the bottom, so there's factorial growth overall. This four thirds is the action difference. Because remember the action for these area functions is plus or minus two thirds. So the difference of those two is four thirds. And here are the first few terms. But now it's easy to expand this at large r. 
And indeed, there's this R minus one factorial, there's this four thirds to the R. But if you organize it in terms of R minus one factorial, R minus two factorial, R minus two factorial, with these factors of the action difference, the resulting coefficients are just the low order terms of the other guy. Okay? So that's what it, that previous expression meant. And I, I invite you to pick you at random your, your favorite special function and just check this. It's easy to look these things up in a table of integrals and then just do the appropriate expansion. The amazing thing is that this type of generic large order, low order behavior called the resurgence relation has been found recently in all sorts of examples in matrix models, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, and string theory, way beyond this simple example of a one dimensional facilitary integral. And the only natural way I can think of to explain this is via some concept of analytic continuation of functional integrals. So you can take this as motivation. All right, now a few words about perturbation theory. As we all know, perturbation theory works very well, but it's generically divergent. And this tells us automatically that perturbation theory should potentially encode some non-perturbative information. The question is how much? So of course, there's this beautiful old argument uh, by Dyson that in QED, one would associate the divergence of some expansion in the fine structure constant, or just in terms of E squared, by the fact that if E squared is negative instead of positive, then there would be, the system would become unstable. And one could argue, and there's no proof here, one could argue physically that that should correspond to a branch cut along the negative E squared axis in the complex plane, which would mean that this expansion here could not actually be convergent there would be no non-zero radius of convergence around zero, but should instead be viewed as an asymptotic series. So this is very well understood, partly from Akadi's nice work on this, but there's still no proof of this property in QED even. Now, one of the critical tools here in this whole argument is Borel summation, which I assume that people are also roughly familiar with. And the idea is very simple that if you have a formal series, perturbative series, where the coefficients are growing factorially fast, let's just call it n factorial, you define a new function, the Borel transform, where you remove, you divide out by this n factorial growth, and t is the Borel plane variable, sort of a transform variable. And now this has some finite radius of convergence if you divide it by the sufficiently high factorial. Then the original series is just recovered formally as this Laplace integral, uh, each t integration just brings another factor of n factorial, which cancels it out again. Now, the advantage of this is, is multifold. One is that you get now a translation of the interesting physical information in this divergent series, which was not at all obvious just from the coefficients it automatic, automatically gets translated into the singularity structure of this function. So this function will generically have singularities like poles or branch cuts. And those things are the non-perturbative physics. Those singularities correspond directly to the saddle points of an integral representation of this problem. So it's a very efficient way of extracting the physical content of a, an asymptotic perturbative series. And you see, for example, that if there were singularities along the positive T axis, either poles or, or branch points, then they would contribute exponentially small imaginary contributions to this Borel sum of the original divergent series. And there's a lot of interesting physics in that. For example, let's go back to some simple quantum mechanical examples. The Zeeman effect and the Stark effect. So imagine, a, say, a hydrogen atom placed in a constant magnetic field or a hydrogen atom placed in a constant electric field. So high orders of perturbation theory have been studied in these problems. And it turns out the coefficients in the Zeeman effect grow like 2n factorial, and they alternate in sign. That means that the Borel singularity is on the negative Borel axis. So when you do this Borel summation uh, procedure, 
you just get a convergent integral representation that's perfectly real and describes the real energy level shifts due to the magnetic field. But if you apply the same formism to the stack effect, then you get a divergent non-alternating asymptotic series. It's growing at the same rate, but they're not alternating inside. This has the consequence that the Borel singularities are on the positive, positive real axis, which means that when you evaluate this Borel sum representation of the divergent series, two things happen. One is there's a real contribution from the principal part, and that gives the real stark shifts. But there's also an imaginary part, which is exponentially small, is an imaginary part to the energy, and this corresponds to ionization. Okay, and this is exactly what we expect physically, the difference between applying a magnetic field or an electric field to an atom. So that's nicely consistent with this Borel formalism. But it's more interesting than that because these two famous problems that uh, are the way we introduce things like instantons to, uh, to quantum mechanics and then to quantum field theory, the double world problem where low-lying states are split into doublets by tunneling, or a periodic potential problem where low-lying states are split into continuous bands by tunneling. These two problems can also be studied by perturbation theory in a given well. And then you discover something rather surprising at first sight, is that in these two cases where the energy is completely real and everything's stable, the perturbation theory is of the stark type form. It's factorially growing and non-alternating. So if you naively took this Borel argument that I just gave you seriously, there would be a problem because the Borel summation would lead naively at leading instanton order to an imaginary part to the energy when there should not be any imaginary part. So there's a very beautiful resolution of this problem, which traced back to work also in the early 1980s, mainly by Bogomolny and by Zinjistan and collaborators, which is the first site of a, an actual trans series in, in a non-trivial problem here, is that if you do this perturbation theory and Borel procedure, it generates some factor through the Borel summation, which is pure, purely imaginary and has an exponential contribution, which is the exponent involves twice the instanton action. So that's telling you that this corresponds to some two instanton type effect, not a one instanton type effect. And now if you look at the dilute instanton gas approximation, at the two instanton level, there's a problem because instantons and anti-instantons actually attract one another. So building a stable instanton gas calculation at the two instanton level, even though it's fine at the one instanton level, at the two instanton level, it requires some extra care and what Bogomolny and Zinjastan showed is that if you take care of this instability of the instanton anti instanton interaction, you actually generate an identical term with the opposite sign. So these unphysical imaginary parts that appear in these two, in principle, separate calculations that you thought were different and independent actually cancel one another. And this is the first example of a trans series. Uh, I, but if you, uh, uh, ho ho hold on one second, Dakadi, hold on. If you, if you combine these two calculations of the perturbative calculation with the non-perturbative calculation, this is an example of somehow restoring the analytic continuation properties of what you're trying to calculate and making it well-defined because these two unphysical contributions actually cancel. And in fact, you can show that this is just the tip of the iceberg. This happens to all orders, all instanton orders and all perturbative orders. And that's what I mean by resurgence and a resurgent trend series. So yes, Arkady. No, no, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, just uh, I'm trying to recollect this is all time with, with uh, Jenny uh, Bogomolny. Uh, but my uh, recollection is that in this way, he did try to avoid it by uh, going uh, for analytical continuation in Kaupling constant. Yes, right. that's right. That's uh, right. So in this way, avoiding, you know, this... Uh, no yes, but you... Right, but... When, so they took the coupling off the positive real axis into yeah, the yeah. complex plane. But the point is that you can do that and when you come back, you generate this imaginary 
No, 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 I understand. Yeah, but the way uh, yeah. he realized it was to go into complex plane of the... Of yes, the yes, yeah, of course, definitely. Okay, okay, okay. So, so in this way, it's close to what you are saying, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. I, I would say this is one of the first hints of a trans series in some non-trivial yeah. physics problem. Uh, oh, so Jared, that, uh, uh, sorry, can I yeah. ask uh, Misha Shaposhnikov? Uh, yeah, but in principle, uh, Borel summation is not unique. There could be other ways of solving this series, which yes. uh, may give uh, another type of uh, this non-perturbative uh, yeah, effect. Yes. Yeah. So, so th this is an interesting point. The, the you know there are many different ways of resumming asymptotic series. It it seems for a reason I, I can't really explain in any simple way that this Borel formalism is best suited to this idea of a Carl in terms of analytic continuation. Um, so let's see, within this, another way to say it would be that there is a resummation method, which now is, gets two names, Borel Carl, which is in fact a unique procedure. Now it's inherently um, based on a Borel transform formalism. How it interfaces with other types of summations, I'm not actually sure. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so the story is actually even more interesting than that. Because if you go back to these famous sort of instanton model problems, and the, the page is unfortunately not wide enough for me to put beyond the first instanton, but just think of now the energy, the perturbative energy is a function of the coupling, but I'm also gonna include the label, which labels which energy level I'm talking about. So in a semi-classical limit, these perturbative wells are very deep. So there are many perturbative levels and you can do perturbation theory about any one of them. Often people talk about the ground state, but that's not necessary. So the plus minus here refers to either the top or the bottom of the band or the upper or lower level here. So the perturbative thing is split by some non-perturbative contribution. Here, I think this is the normalization for the periodic guy. And there's some prefactor stuff which involves a certain power depending on N of the coupling. But then there's a series of fluctuations in H bar with coefficients, of course, that are functions of N. So this would be the, you know, the one instanton saddle. And then there's the two instanton, three instanton, any number of instantons. And this is the perturbative saddle. Now, remarkably, these fluctuations around the one instant on saddle can be expressed in a completely closed form in terms of the original perturbative saddle. And this is really surprising. And it's true for all these dot, dot, dots here also. At any non-perturbative order, whatever instant on order you want, the fluctuations around that multi-instanton can be expressed explicitly in terms of this formal asymptotic series. So an extreme way to say that is that perturbation theory somehow in some very rich non-obvious way encodes everything to all orders in this trans series expansion. So this would be an example of this raindrop picture where in fact, there's now an infinite number of raindrops and somehow there's this very rich lattice of relations between the different saddle points that can be all interrelated by something that is called a set of bridge equations in Eccles language. That if you can understand these, you can actually use them to quantitatively relate the fluctuations around some multi non saddle to the perturbative one or another one of the multi non saddle. Uh, so that's very surprising because you, you could easily have expected that this property for ordinary one-dimensional integrals would of course fall flat and fail once you go to something infinite dimensional like even a quantum mechanical path integral. And yet it seems to be valid, at least in a very wide class of quantum mechanical problems. Yes, Arkady, again. Uh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt all the time, but you know, yeah, it, it, you, all... you're not really sorry, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do. <laughs> uh, no, no, but I, I mean that why it's so much uh, surprising because when you consider perturbation theory, no, even near, near non-trivial trajectory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you could wait uh, some similarity in perturbation theory uh, the, when you are, you see, it's like 
you know, having curve uh, near the curve or um, uh, the trajectory not curved. So in certain perturbation theory, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the curvature is not that crucial. No, you, yeah, you see what yeah. I mean? Yeah. So I, I think, yeah, I mean, we could discuss this forever, but I think the, the fact that it's so explicit and so concrete, I think that is surprising. The fact that there's some relation between these is maybe not so surprising, but the fact that it's so simple and universal, that I think is surprising. But for now, just take it as sort of inspiration or motivation to look deeper. That. So now let's, let's start thinking towards field theory. And so, of course, we want more than just one coupling, one parameter. We'd like to be able to understand a functional integral where there's not just a coupling constant, but there's masses and maybe a chemical potential, maybe a temperature, maybe a background magnetic field, maybe a background electric field, something like that. So multiple parameters. And if you start trying to think of this in terms of some saddle point expansion being related to some perturbative expansions, as you vary these parameters, possibly in the complex plane, then clearly the saddle points are gonna shift. They're gonna move. This is like the Stokes phenomenon. And even which ones dominate and which ones contribute will change. So this is a fantastically complicated and interesting problem. And even in the mathematics literature, most of the work has been done, even in the finite dimensional problems, most of the work has been done with just one coupling, one parameter. So I wanna show you a few interesting things that happen if you just introduce one more. Okay, so it's just a first step here. And I'm choosing to do it in terms of say large M expansions. And in particular, how can we see a phase transition if we have a coupling type parameter and some, let's call it a large N, some size parameter for the system. Now clearly you can have different limits. You can now take large N, weak coupling, or small coupling, you can take fixed N, weak coupling, small coupling, you can take fixed coupling, large N, small N, et cetera, et cetera. We can also take a tough type coupling where we take weak coupling and large N, but such that the product is somehow fixed, but it could be fixed to be big or small. And the question is, how do these trans series and resurgence, how do they see a phase transition in these situations? And it's quite interesting. So let's look back at the periodic potential problem just to illustrate what can happen. So here's the coupling H bar. Here's the energy as a function of both H bar and the band label N. So this is the lowest band, first band, second band, third band. So when H bar is small or you're deep inside the well, so this is a cosine potential going from minus one to one, the bands are exponentially narrow. And this one instanton approximation is very good. But if you look very high up in the spectrum, way above the top of the potential, of course, the spectrum is roughly continuous and they're very narrow gaps. And in fact, there's a genuine phase transition here between narrow bands and narrow gaps. And the phase transition happens when this Tuft variable is something of order one in this normalization eight over pi. And there's an interesting instanton effect here because we all know very well that down here, the narrow bands can be described by this uh, instanton type approximation tunneling between neighboring wells. But it turns out that the narrow gaps up here can be described in terms of complex instantons. Up here, the turning points are in the complex plane because the energy is above the potential. But the instantons that tunnel between these complex turning points, when exponentiated, they give the width of the gaps. And as you approach the top of the, the potential, so near where this uh, parameter is, the width of the bands, you should be able to see, I hope, that the width of the band is actually equal to the width of the gap. And the width here is equal to the width here and so on. And there's this phase transition happening here that as you approach from below or from above, the one instanton approximation becomes hopeless. You need to sum all instantons. These are not exponentially narrow here. And there's a very interesting 
nonlinear phase transition happening here where all instantons have to be involved. But at this point, the physics switches from real instantons to complex instantons. So this is a nonlinear version of the Stokes phenomenon of switching between a real subtle point dominating the physics to a co complex subtle point dominating the physics. So even in this simple quantum mechanical system, we can in fact identify a phase transition. Now, if we go head towards quantum field theory, the, the earliest example that I know of, of some non-perturbative calculation in field theory actually was done before field theory by Heisenberg and his student Euler in 1935. They calculated what we would nowadays call the one loop effective action for QED in a background constant electromagnetic field. So here's the in diagram language, summing these one fermion loop um, diagrams. And you see this scary looking formula is actually a Borel integral. Here's the integral with the exponential and there's just this thing here, this horrible looking thing is just the Borel transform function. Now I stress that this is a paradigm of effective field theory. This is where you're taking the heavy fields, the, the electrons and positrons, and you're integrating out at the mass scale set by them. And you have what's left is the effective field theory description of the light fields, which are the photons, that after you've integrated out the fermions. And the exact integral representation is exactly the Borel sum of if you did this perturbative calculation. This is also a beautiful example of the Stark effect ionization problem, because if you have a purely magnetic background, then this is completely real. You've just redistributed the energy density in the Dirac C. But if the background is instead an electric field, then it corresponds to switching B squared to minus E squared, electric field squared. And then there's an imaginary part in this one loop effective action, and that corresponds to pair production from vacuum. So it's a very beautiful example, and it's completely explicit, much more so than even the hydrogen atom Stark effect problem. Now, let's push this analogy a little bit. And let's introduce also a monochromatic frequency. So I'm introducing one more parameter beyond the overall amplitude of the electric field. So this was first done by Keldish in the early days of lasers for studying the ionization problem in a realist, sort of realistic laser in atoms. And then it was adapted to this QD context by Brazan. It was actually Brazan's PhD thesis and also by Popov in, in the Soviet Union. So there's a parameter called gamma, the Keldish adiabaticity parameter, which basically tells you how rapid this oscillation is in some dimensionless units. And so you can do a WKB calculation and the pair production rate, or think of it as an ionization rate, is exponentially small. There's this basic prefactor and then there's just some function of gamma and it's some weird elliptic function. It's not that important what it is. This is a doable calculation. This is what Brazan and company did. Now in the slow limit where gamma is small, this thing just reduces to a constant. I think I normalized it to be one. And this is just the familiar tunneling hair production, Euler, Heisenberg, Schwinger type factor. But if you go to the opposite limit where the frequency is very large, so gamma is large, this function develops a logarithmic behavior on gamma. And this exponential that you thought was an exponential actually becomes a power. So you put in all the stuff, it's a power of the basically the normalized vector potential. So this is actually a perturbative result. And the order of the perturbative result is interesting. It's twice because it's a probability. The binding energy, which is 2mc squared, divided by the photon energy. So this is a, the change between these two things is a change between producing particles by tunneling to producing particles by multi-photon ionization over the barrier. And this can actually be understood just in complete analogy with the, what I just spoke about in the periodic potential case as a transition between physics dominated by real instantons and physics dominated by complex instantons. So this is an example of this, again, of the Stokes phenomenon, but in the context of the 
um, of the change of um, whether it's a complex or a real saddle point. And this has applications in the world line representation of quantum field theory. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna have to skip this. So uh, you can also apply this for rapidly driven systems. So let's go back and look at this, you know, now that we have sort of a little bit of motivation that maybe this can, can work, let's go back and look at this type of formula, which has a huge question mark here. Is it possible to try and interpret this general functional integral as a sum over what are called thimbles? Just think of a thimble as a functional infinite dimension version of a steepest descent contour in configuration space. To think of deforming this measure factor, this functional integral into integrations over just steepest descent contours in configuration space with some Jacobian and summing over all these thimbles that are attached to saddle points. Now, the advantage of doing this, if you could do this, would be that on a given steepest descent contour, the integration becomes well-defined. So you can now do it however you want. You can use instantons, you can do Monte Carlo. In principle, this is all in principle. The reason is that the definition of a steepest descent contour is that the imaginary part of this thing in the exponent stays fixed. That's actually what it means to be a steepest descent contour. So if that were true, you would just pull out this phase factor. And then the real part also has well-defined behavior on a steepest descent contour. And this would now be ideally suited for some analysis, numerical or analytic. It's more complicated than that, of course, that's a superficial description of, of what we would like to do. Because remember that there are parameters in here. And as you vary those parameters, the saddle points move. Therefore, the steepest descent contours move. And depending on the values of the parameters, there can be a Stokes transition where actually a steepest descent contour that you thought was relevant is actually not relevant. So there's this number here, which is supposed to represent that depending on say the parameters in here or listed in here, a given thimble corresponding to a given saddle may or may not contribute. This may go to zero this time. So this is a very, very complicated expression. It's not very well understood in detail in quantum field theory yet, but there has been some progress. So one idea in this story is that in order to generate these functional steepest descent contours, one idea could be to first of all, complexify the fields and then think of some complexified gradient flow. So tau is some Langevin time, some flow time. And if you solve this complexified flow with a complex conjugate here, this is built in order to keep the imaginary part of this thing in the exponent constant. That's the consequence of this gradient flow idea. So if you could do that in principle, you could um, then define the steepest descent contour and try to do this numerically. So there were a couple of extremely interesting breakthrough papers in, in applying this idea quite a long time ago now using the example of the four-dimensional relativistic first gas, which is a complex scalar field theory. It has a sign problem. And they use this idea just looking at the, the simplest possible thimble in this case. And already here, there's some progress that actually you can see the phase transition. Now, I, I'm not a lattice gauge theorist, so I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but this is a, an important development. And there's a lot of work trying to implement this in, uh, in real calculations. And since I'm running out of time, I think I will just refer you to Goksha Bajaz's colloquium in this series some months ago. I don't remember exactly when it was, but you can look on Igor's webpage and just go back and look at uh, Goksha gave a uh, colloquium here talking specifically about this problem. And there are a number of problems that have now been solved. One, for example, is the two-dimensional Turing model. Its phase transition has been calculated using Monte Carlo and these 
symbol ideas. There's also an interesting idea to, to Fukuma and, and company, which is addressing algorithmically the problem that if you got really close to this steepest descent contour, you might be trapped there and not see other ones. And they overcame this by making the coupling or these parameters dynamical variables and tempering with that. And so they're able to probe multiple saddle points rather than just getting stuck in some particular saddle point. Um, an analytic example that you can study is the two-dimensional gross niveau model. So this is an interesting model field theory. It's asymptotically free. It has dynamical mass generation, it has chiral symmetry breaking at large NF. And it's some sort of baby model of various aspects of QCD. And it has an interesting phase diagram in the temperature chemical potential plane that was only clarified you know, moderately recently. There's a massive phase where there's a uniform non-zero condensate, psi bar psi condensate form. There's a massless phase. There's a tricritical point, And there's a crystalline phase. And in order to identify this crystalline phase, you have to do, solve a fairly non-trivial problem, which is to solve the gap equation, but using a condensate that's actually X-dependent. And to be able to do this for any temperature and any chemical potential. Well, this is a special model. It has some integrability properties, which means you can actually solve that problem. But imagine you couldn't solve that problem. What would you do? For example, in something like QCD, you might try to do a ginsburg landau expansion, right? The, the most interesting points here are the tricritical point and this point here, the transition at zero temperature. So if you did a ginsburg landau expansion, it turns out that's an expansion around the tricritical point. So you just expand your thermodynamic potential in a series in the condensate and its derivatives. The coefficients are functions of temperature and chemical potential that you can calculate. And you discover that successive orders of this expansion reveal this crystal phase in more and more detail. And they're extremely accurate near the tricritical point. So it's a way of identifying the tricritical point and probing close to the tricritical point. However, it's difficult to use the expansion around the tricritical point to reach this point here down at zero temperature. So in order to probe that point, another thing you can do is to go out to extremely high chemical potential, but zero temperature. And that expansion, we see a trans series developing. The large chemical potential expansion is convergent. The expansion around mu equals infinity. And if you calculate some number of terms, 10 terms or whatever, you can identify the radius of convergence and that gives you the critical chemical potential, two over pi. But if you look at the low density expansion, it's very interesting. The low density, I've written it here in terms of density instead of chemical potential. It's just a little easier to write the formula. And you see the development of these non-perturbative terms that go well beyond any formal low density expansion that you would get from textbook methods in uh, density expansions. And that's a way to identify the quantum phase transition at t equals zero. Um, I'm gonna have to skip this. Let, let me mention it, but I will um, skip through it. A two-dimensional model, sorry, a, a lattice one plaquette model of two-dimensional yang mills goes by the name of this gross wit and Wadia unitary matrix model. It's a very beautiful example of resurgence and phase transitions where there are two parameters, the tuft coupling and the N being the size of the matrices. And this has been studied in great deal, the pioneering work of Marcos Mourinho using resurgence to study these uh, matrix models. And things can be done in great detail. So there's some sort of order parameter, which is the expectation value of the determinant of U and its formal large N expansion would just look like this. But in fact, there are exponentially small large N instanton expansions where the instanton action is a function of the tuft coupling. And all of this can be done in great detail in this particular model. And so for example, here's the large N expansion at weak coupling. It has some 
series, you can work out all of these functions just by plugging in this ansatz into the differential equation. But you can also, from the differential equation, generate this one instanton and two instanton corrections. The weak, in, weak coupling instanton is some strange function of t. And you see resurgence because if you look at these one instanton fluctuations, you can calculate them very easily from the differential equation. But now if you look at the large order growth of these terms, resurgence said that they should be related to the low order terms here. And indeed they are. If you look at these functions of T, they grow factorially with a power that depends on this exponential here. And then there are subleading corrections and this correction here is exactly the first non-trivial term here. So remember I showed you this example with the airy function at the beginning that the large order subleading coefficients of the large order growth of the coefficients were related to the low orders of the next term. Here's an example where there's coefficients are not just numbers, they're functions of some other variable. So this is demonstrating this resurgence structure is preserved even when you have two variables, multiple variables. Okay, so let me skip all this. I wanna, if I, Igor, can I have just say a couple of minutes more? Take, take more time if you need it. It's not very strict. Okay, okay. just, just it'll be less than five minutes. So okay. last couple of years, I've been working with a, a pure math mathematician, a video custom, who is one of the people who's proved a lot of the interesting results in this resurgence story. And the question I wanted to ask is, okay, this is all well and good to talk about nice simple models, quantum mechanics, and even some integrable models, but what about a really difficult problem, such as QCD phase diagram, or some model where the only hope you have is of calculating some number of terms in an expansion, maybe five if you're lucky, maybe 10 if you're really lucky. So here's a question. Given those coefficients, if I had them to all orders, resurgence would tell me that they encode some information about some other non-perturbative contributions. But suppose you only have a few terms, where a few means you know, somewhere between zero and 20, say. Can you use these ideas to actually extract some information from a finite number of terms? So the, the idea, to think of here is this is a very interesting point, theoretically, experimentally, this potential critical point. But suppose you only know how to do expansions around here or around here. Can you somehow use that information to learn something far away? Okay, so this is a pretty radical question and there's a surprising answer to it. So we tested it on a particular example called, it has a name, it's a nonlinear differential equation called the Penlevé one equation. The reason for doing this was that this equation actually shows up in various matrix models in physics, but more importantly, it's used as a test case in, by people in numerical analysis for different extrapolation methods and numerical integration methods. So this is one of the sort of, if you have a new idea, you have to test it on this model. Also, this equation has a very complex complex, no pun intended, structure in the complex plane with various Stokes transitions that are known analytically. So now here's a question. Suppose you try to solve this equation at large X on the positive real axis. You generate an asymptotic expansion. Since you have a differential equation, it's easy to generate coefficients. So you can change how many coefficients you have. So suppose you only have those coefficients could you use them to learn about this Stokes transition, this anti-Stokes transition? And in this region here, the solution has a completely different type of expansion. It has a pole expansion. So this is like these Li Yang zero type arguments. It will be a complete phase transition. Um, so this is the question. Suppose we only know these coefficients out here to some order n, how much do those coefficients actually know about these non-perturbative transitions elsewhere in the complex plane. Okay, it seems hopeless. Well, it turns out, interestingly, it's not hopeless. In a recent paper with Kostin, which I, I have to apologize to this audience, is that it's very mathematical and hard to read, but there is an applications paper in the works. 
that will give a whole bunch of physics examples. Turns out there's an optimal way to solve this problem. There's an optimality theorem. And there are various near optimality methods. And if you apply these tricks, if you just give me, this plot here is, if you give me 50 terms in the expansion here, I can describe accurately the Stokes transitions across this boundary, across this boundary, and I can recover these poles of the solution in this completely different regime. You can also cross onto high Riemann sheets directly. And if you give me just 10 terms of the expansion around here, I can identify the first three poles here, which are enough to completely generate the whole pole ladder structure if you allow me to then use the differential equation. So this is very surprising to me, is that the implication is that if you design some extrapolation method that uses some of these ideas from resurgence and Borel summation, then it seems possible that you can actually extract some non-obvious global non-perturbative information from a relatively modest amount of perturbative input. And you can go from a regime out here to some very distant regime where the behavior is completely different. So let me conclude with one example that is probably familiar to people. Let's go back to this euler heisenberg example. It's an expansion in weak field usually, it's usually expressed that way. So the expansion in weak magnetic field, if you just take 10 terms of that expansion and apply these extrapolation techniques that uh, I haven't specified, I'm just mentioning, you can generate this gold curve here, which is underneath the green one. And I've scaled out a factor of uh, B to the fourth just to put it on a simple plot. And this is the weak field limit and the green is the strong field limit, the logarithmic behavior at strong field. And they interpolate perfectly from just 10 input coefficients. So that's going from weak coupling to strong coupling. But now I can do something else in principle. I can also go from magnetic to electric, which is a rotation. It's like a Minkowski to Euclidean rotation. So if I take 10 terms of the expansion at weak magnetic field, I can generate a representation of the Euler-Heisenberg effect of Lagrangian in an electric background, just by rotating by I, and I can extract the exponentially small imaginary part. And the fit is this gold curve here. Here I've plotted it over four orders of magnitude. The dots are the result of this extrapolation and the gold is the exact exponentially small contribution. And I'm not, I'm not gonna show it here because they've already gone over my already over five minutes. This can also be applied at higher loops in this expansion where much less is known analytically. All right, so let me conclude. So one thing is resurgence is a, a new and in some sense improved form of asymptotics. People have studied it in various applications recently in, in quantum mechanics, quantum field theory, string theory, matrix models. And it's revealed some deeper connections between perturbative and non-perturbative physics that we're still trying to understand, but seem to be at least interesting so far. One thing I emphasize today is that by considering multi-parameter trans series, you can actually probe phase transitions that you can't do if you just stick with one variable. And at the end, I just mentioned very quickly this idea of resurgent extrapolation that you can actually get surprisingly high precision information about non-perturbative physics from just a few coefficients on a, in a perturbative expansion. So let me stop there. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for a very nice presentation. Now we could go to questions. And the first question is from Arkady Weinstein. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, Jared, I still hope that you can forgive my questions. Of course. Uh, so, uh, no, I mean, kind of a little bit generic uh, uh, issue uh, I'd like to ask. Uh, you know, when, when you are discussing this, um, and I, uh, you know, uh, analytical continuation to complex uh, uh, field in particular, mm. uh, you know, there are kind of two different two two uh, two different 
uh, stuff related to this one is that you uh, when you're going say for example from minkowski to euclidean you you're making analytical continuation in in the parameter uh, which is defined you know kind of uh, time interval right so so you can yeah. say that you are taking this uh, period uh, time uh, distance to be imaginary right mm -hmm. uh, your general approach was that you are taking uh, you know integration variables into the complex plane right so so the yeah. field is, mm -hmm. uh, is complex right yeah. And and it's clear that it should be some kind of, uh, you know, how to say, uh, you know, re relation between these two, because generically it could be kind of, you know, uh, so this analytical continuation in parameters like time or mm -hmm. in field, or you are saying that, uh, say, uh, continuation in field would, would cover everything. You, you see what I'm trying to ask about? Yeah, so um, I think the, the basic idea is that uh, it should be viewed as analytic continuation in the field variables. Yeah. This would be the analogy to the finite dimensional problems. But in certain, for certain quantities, you can reinterpret this in terms of analytic continuation in, say, the space time variables. Yeah. So, so, but, you're, uh, but I don't know how general that is. Yeah. Yeah. Where, but whereas I think. That you are Sorry. saying that that analytical continuation in field would should cover everything in 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 principle, right? In principle. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. No, it's what I was asking. But also in parameters, okay. So, right? In parameters. Right. But but time it is also like a parameter, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 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 you you are saying that you need both, or it's enough to to consider you know analytical continuation in field. Yeah. Uh, or generic unit balls. So, what, so let me give you an, a concrete example. So this is actually where I started learning about resurgence. So think about this um, Schwinger effect problem. So pair production in some background field. By the way, there are explicit proposals to do these sorts of experiments at Daisy and at Slack now. Mm -hmm. um, so one way to formulate this problem is to use this Feynman word line representation. So you can represent the one-loop effective action as a four-dimensional Minkowski path integral. And we know exactly what the action is. And so you can think of trying to calculate the saddle point contribution now from a very complicated background field really resembling some focused short pulse laser. And so the strategy would be to first try to find the um, saddle point in this quantum mechanical path integral, easier than now doing it in field space. And you discover that if the electric field has some interesting time structure that can lead to interference be between produced particles, then in fact, the description requires, a, a saddle point description requires the um, complexification of this four dimensional Minkowski space. But when you try to actually construct these um, closed um, saddle point contours, you see that it, it's also, you're solving some um, coupled differential equations in the proper time, okay? Mm -hmm. Proper time is the variable, uh, the parameter. It's mm -hmm. actually useful to actually also complexify that proper time variable in trying to solve those saddle point equations. So that would be an analog, I think, of what you're saying. I see. That both the fields and the you know, space-time variables, but in this case, it's just a proper time variable, might need to both be complexified in order to find and describe these saddles. Okay. Okay, so, so in this way, uh, generically, it's not enough, just complex field, right? I mean, or, or at least it's better to have both. The, the, whole, the whole problem is complex. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. In, in both senses of the word. Yeah. Okay, next question is from Kirill Boguslavsky. Hi, thank you a lot for the great talk. Um, are there actually quantum theories or quantum field theories where the counter example has been proven? Um, I mean, that the resurgence is actually impossible in those systems? Or is the statement that a quantum mechanics, uh, mechanical system or quantum field theory should involve resurgence? Um, so it's not quite clear what you mean by resurgence is impossible. 
so that you have um, this, this specific generic formula between the, the weak, weak coupling or the perturbative terms and the non-perturbative structure. Uh, sorry, sorry, the, the, the coefficients of the, of the higher order terms. Yeah, so, which you showed. so I'm not aware of any explicit case where it fails. There are cases where it's very hard to verify and very hard to calculate. But let, let me give you an example that for a while people thought it failed. Let's do supersymmetric quantum mechanics instead of quantum mechanics. Okay, so supersymmetric quantum mechanics. So very often the, the discussion is phrased in terms of calculating the ground state energy, for example, in a problem. So suppose you try to apply this to supersymmetric quantum mechanics where the ground state energy is perturbatively zero. So that's a pretty boring perturbative expansion, right? Every coefficient is zero. And yet you can give me, I can give you a supersymmetric quantum mechanics problem where there are nevertheless non-perturbative contributions. So this was raised as an objection that, okay, so it doesn't work. Well, not quite, not so fast, because in fact, what's going on is there is a perturbative contribution. It's just that it vanishes for the ground state, but it doesn't vanish for the first excited state or the second excited state or the third excited state. And if you recall, can I show my, I'm still showing my screen. Sorry, if I can just scan back here. This relation here involved the density of states, the derivative of the perturbative energy with respect to the level number. And that's not equal to zero for the ground state, okay? So in fact, it is still true. If you look at one of these supersymmetric models that has a vanishing perturbative expansion, but it has a non-zero, non-perturbative contribution, it's still true that if you look at the perturbative expansion for any n and calculate the density of states evaluated at n equals zero, this formula is still true. Okay. Another way to look at it is if, if you slightly break supersymmetry softly, then this thing that was zero suddenly becomes non-zero. And then you see all of this resurgent non-perturbative structure and it goes to zero just by a resonance effect. You're going to a very specific point where some, uh, some you know, number of flavors or something is an integer. And there's an, even, there's an even simpler example of this, which is if you think of a Bessel function, at large x, a Bessel function has some exponential and then it's multiplied by some series. But if the index of the Bessel function happens to be a half integer, half what it integer, and that series truncates, okay? And so it's not a divergent series, and, then, and that's an exact element, and therefore you think that the, this whole story disappears. But in fact, that's just a, an artifact of taking a very specially tuned parameter where there's some extra symmetry. And if you take the generic case of the parameter, then you see the full resurgent structure, okay? So, so that, that's an interesting effect. I mean, knowing that this can just come and go as you tune parameters is, is not, a, not a simple statement. So, so, so if, if I may ask one more uh, yeah. as a follow-up. Uh, so in complex analysis, you have this, uh, I mean, it's, it's a, almost a trivial thing that I'm, I'm going to say. Uh, you have this very nice uh, global property that basically you, you can you can look at uh, poles and and uh, about some structure polynomial structure and this will tell you about some very uh, general properties of the function um, mm -hmm. in very different yeah. places. Mm -hmm. So so are basically quantum field theories or or quantum theories or even or equations such equations of motion the the fact that you that, that one goes from real into into this complexified plane is it a kind of this effect that, that you, you start to look globally at your system and therefore you can look at points and, and they tell you about regions somewhere else. Is, yeah. it, is this interpretation so, that might so, work? So within the realm of these finite dimensional exponential integrals and 
finite order and finite number of differential equations, this is how it's formulated. Okay, so, but even there, it's very rich mathematically once you go beyond just one dimension. But there, there are genuine theorems okay, about, so for example, in nonlinear differential equations and even some forms of nonlinear partial differential equations, there are genuine rigorous results about this applying to solutions. The interesting thing from my point of view, and I think in, in the context of field theory and even in quantum mechanics, is that if you go to a problem which is infinite dimensional, then all bets are off at this point rigorously. And very little is known. And the, you know, the modus operandi at the moment is to explore and see what happens. And there's been a fair bit of work recently and in problems of increasing complexity, again, no pun, um, certain things seem to work and to help. Whether it's ever going to develop into something that solves some mass gap problem in Yang Mills, we don't know yet. Right? But it's at least revealed some deeper relations between perturbative and non-perturbative physics that we may be able to take advantage of. Thank you. Sure. Okay, next question is Andrei Sternitz. Uh, yes, uh, thank you very much. So thank you, thank you for this very inspiring uh, talk and also very inspiring work in, in general. I have two questions, one uh, uh, technical and one philosophical. Yeah, sure. Technical question is uh, about the end of your talk. So you mentioned this work uh, on how yeah. to recover non-perturbative results from a finite number. Yeah. Uh, right, yeah. and uh, uh, can I just ask, so I suppose that uh, there are conditions attached to uh, these, these, uh, this perturbative information, hopefully in some human uh, terms. Uh, yeah. because we, we, we know examples where even simple things like a radius of convergence of the series is extremely difficult to determine even if you uh, know 200 uh, terms, right? I mean, and then, then you go to 300 and then the result changes, right? So. So there are these uh, uh, simple examples, and I suppose that if you have 10 terms of a perturbative expansion, then unless there are certain conditions, then it's very difficult to hope that, uh, yeah. that uh, you get the, uh, the non-perturbative uh, result uh, correctly. Yeah. Right. And then, sorry, can I just ask a philosophical question immediately? Yeah. It's, very, sure. it's very philosophical. Uh, uh, can one hope to, uh, to prove some dualities uh, uh, using this approach? Um, uh, so yes to the uh, previous one. So um, maybe I can mention a simple example that you won't be very surprised by, but uh, maybe hadn't thought about it in this language. Mm -hmm. So think about the 2D Ising model. Mm -hmm. It has a very simple duality that we all understand in various ways. Yep. So, you know, calculate free energy or calculate some correlator to some length as a function of temperature. And there's an explicit mapping between high temperature and low temperature, right? This, this yes. duality. Yeah. Yeah. Think, of it, think of it, for simplicity, think of it on the square 2D lattice. So in that case, you can really see this duality. You, you can do the expansion around infinite temperature. <laughs> Radius of convergence tells you where the critical temperature is. And what resurgence would tell you in this case is that from the details of the expansion at infinite temperature, you can deduce the, the details of the expansion near the critical temperature. Mm -hmm. But then because of duality, from the expansion at infinite temperature, you can immediately write down the expansion at zero temperature. And then from studying that, you can learn about the expansion near the critical temperature, but they're on the other side of the critical temperature. Mm -hmm. And that all works. And at the level of the free energy, you're probably not very surprised by that, but at the level of the correlators, it becomes an interesting non-trivial problem because the correlators now depend not just on the temperature, but say on the distance. And if you go along the diagonal of the, of the uh, lattice, these solutions are this is the old work of Jimbo and Miwa, is that these are solutions of the so-called Penlevé-6 equation, 
And so this is a case where you can do everything in great detail. And in fact, they're encoded in um, uh, conformal block expansions. Mm -hmm. And so you can really see all these dualities between high temperature and low temperature and on both sides of the critical temperature. So that's maybe too simple an example, but that's the sort of thing you would like to be able to do. There hasn't been, there's been some work in dualities in some supersymmetric theories that are localizable. Um, but I think it's a general understanding doesn't really exist yet. Mm -hmm. But it's an interesting problem and I, I have actually been thinking about it for some time now. So, mm -hmm. um, and your first question, um, uh, the detail. Yes. 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 So there are some conditions. Um, the basic condition is that, so the strongest results are if you know that the function you're trying to describe is resurgent. Um, now, that may seem strange because on the one hand, mathematicians are telling us that all interesting functions are resurgent, so there doesn't seem to be much content to that. But the technical definition of resurgence would be that if it's an asymptotic series that you're describing, you immediately go to the Borel plane. So now you're dealing with a convergent function. It's much simpler. And now resurgence would say that that thing has isolated singularities and that it's endlessly analytically continuable. So there are no sort of natural boundaries in that problem. And under those circumstances, this result of ours is that there's an optimal way to do that extrapolation from a finite number of terms, which if I can forgive me, just say it in some mathematical words, if there's a given number of singularities and you have some idea where they are, then that defines a Riemann surface. Mm -hmm. And within the class of all functions with the same Riemann surface, there's a way to find the function that comes closest to the one you had and their explicit error bounds as a function of the number of coefficients. Mm -hmm. So in other, in other words, you tell me how many coefficients you have and you tell me something about the Riemann surface then I can tell you what precision you will get anywhere on the Riemann surface. Mm -hmm. Now, maybe it's not enough. Well, okay, tough. You have to give me some more coefficients, <laughs> but that's the way it can be formulated. Okay. It works. Yep. Now, mm -hmm. the, the, the stronger way of actually using this result is that often in physics, we don't really care about knowing the function on the whole Riemann surface. For example, if we're interested in things like identifying a um, phase transition point and calculating critical exponents, what we really care about is going really close to where we think the critical point is, right? And looking at that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it turns out these ideas of using, first of all, going to the Borel plane and then using what are called uniformizing maps in the neighborhood of the, these critical points gives you exponential improvements of um, uh, precision in the, in the immediate vicinity. So we have various examples and you know, this will take some time to write up I'm afraid, but you can make a surprising amount of progress. And mm -hmm. the thing is you, you have strict results of how much precision you can expect given a certain number of terms. Okay. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, it will be helpful to, to, to read yeah. this uh, yeah. paper and kind of yeah. directed at physicists rather than mathematicians. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sure. Okay, um, next question from David Washka. Yeah, hello, Gerald. Um, uh, hi, David. Long time no <laughs> see. Yes. So, can one say, uh, or is there the hope that from a knowledge of finite number of terms in the asymptotic freedom phase of QCD, uh, so in the perturbative phase, one can somehow conclude for the non perturbative yeah. physics of confinement? Yeah, and well. if yes, how far <laughs> out from such a program? Okay, so if yes, that would have been my title. Okay. <laughs> no, I mean, we, we can dream, right? Um, I don't have anything concrete to say about that, but l let me say something that's slightly frivolous, but maybe 
can spark some. Uh, let, let's look back at this problem here. So this is this periodic potential problem with a cosine potential. And I said, you know, we, we know how to do expansions down here where it's, you know, say, um, deep down in the semi-classical regime. And we know how to do expansions way up here. But the way we describe this problem down here is completely different from up here. We, we use the, um, well, up here, it's this uh, nearly free electron model. And down here, it's this tight binding type model in solid state physics language. And you know, even the, if you think of it, the, the degrees of freedom and the way you're even describing the problem are completely different. And yet, what I'm saying is that from this, you know, in this particular example, from this trend series, I can follow it all the way through from here to here. Now, it's part, the fact that you can do that in this case is partly due to the fact that this is a nice integrable model and you know, there's all sorts of special things about having just a cosine potential. But at least gives some hope that maybe even in some more complicated problem where you don't have complete control and it's not integrable, maybe there's some way of at least seeing how this set of variables you use to describe the physics as you approach a phase transition, you have to change your description completely. And maybe you can learn how you have to change your description completely. And if you're really lucky, maybe you can see how it transforms to a different set of dominant saddles being complex instantons rather than real instantons. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the answer for QCD at this point is, is I, I don't know, I wish I did, mm -hmm. but uh, to me, it's motivation to push further. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, the next question is a technical question from Zhu Wei Du. He asked me to read the question on his behalf. Okay. Is it possible to include non-integer power factors in trend series like h bar uh, to the power of beta where beta is non-integer? And if it is the case, uh, this non-integer powers will come as h bar to the n and beta or h bar to the n plus beta. Hmm. Um, sorry, can you read it again? It's, it's so saying the, 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 up the, here there will be h bar to a different power? To the non-integer power. Mm -hmm. So yes. h bar to beta where beta is non-integer. Yeah, this happens um, in, in various case, cases. So, um, so let's, the simplest example would be to look at this, um, this Euler-Heisenberg example, right? The perturbative expansion is an expansion in the electric field squared, right? just by symmetry. It's not an expansion in the electric field. It's in the electric field squared. And yet, so let's call that H bar, the electric field squared. The non-perturbative expression we all know very well for ionization or tunneling is e to the minus one over the electric field, not one over the electric field squared. And that's directly related to the fact that the coefficients grow like two n factorial, not n factorial. Mm -hmm. So there it's a, say a square root of h bar. And that's a generic uh, statement that if it's, a, if it's not n factorial, but two n factorial or three n factorial, or some other factor of n factorial, then that will show up in the, uh, your parameter of your perturbative expansion appearing in a non-perturbative term as a fractional power. Now, those are still rational, whether it can be completely general for irrational, I don't know of any simple examples, but this is, and even the ionization version of this, the uh, Stark effect, mm -hmm. the same thing happens there, right? It's two n factors, not n factor. Okay. And the perturbative series is in even powers of the electric field, but the ionization rate is exponential of minus one over the electric field. But, but your other examples there for large gamma is even more pronounced in this sense, right? Yes, yes. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's logarithmic. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. So um, I don't see any additional questions from the audience. I did have one question of my own. Uh, 
when you consider a gauge theory at high temperature, there is this uh, perturbative expansion that goes up to the uh, coupling to the sixth power, and then the logs mm -hmm. kick in, and the non perturbative things mm -hmm. start to be uh, showing up. So mm -hmm. from that knowledge in the gauge theory, uh, how much additional information you could uh, take out or extract yeah. using this? I don't know, but some, somebody should do it. It shouldn't be that so difficult. Just, just any, finding any, time. Any guess? Any guess? No, I, I've, you know, I've obviously thought of the problem, but I haven't done any calculations there. Um, yeah. OK. <coughs> So I don't see any other questions. So if there is nothing else, I would like to thank uh, Gerald for a very lovely presentation, a very interesting, and uh, I think everybody learned a lot here. So uh, I'll give maybe another 10 seconds for anybody who wanted to ask the questions. But other than that, we will be wrapping this up. Thanks, Igor. Thank you. Thank you.